reverb. You hear it all the time. Unless you're in an anechoic chamber or in the middle of a snowy field, the sounds you're hearing are reverberating off what's around and coming back to your ears. It gives those sounds space. In the earliest days of recorded music, you had to do it for real. If you wanted big room reverb, you had to be in a big room. That is, of course, very cumbersome. What if you want a different kind of reverb? What if you want a whole lot of it? You probably don't have access to a cave to record vocal tracks. So machines were made for audio engineers to be able to create and control reverb independently from the instruments they were recording. Nowadays, those machines are mostly computers and software, but that's a very recent thing. And audio engineers have been creating and controlling reverb for much longer than that. The question I want to answer in this video is how? <laughs> how, how do you create space and control reverb with an analog machine? And I figured if I'm going to be asking about rare analog music gear that makes reverb, it would make sense that I would go to, well. So I'm here with my friend Jim from Reverb, our reverb expert <laughs> slash reverb expert. It's great to be here and it's also uh, great to see you. It's great to see you too. <laughs> I'm ecstatic right now because this is like the first after vaccine shoot where we're in a studio. It's so great to be with you, man. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad Thanks to be so breaking that ice. So yeah. let's talk about reverb. Yes. The reason why reverb is so cool is that mm -hmm. it really is the first effect in human history. And the absence of reverb, if you've ever been to like an anechoic chamber. Yeah, right, I have. It's crazy. It doesn't feel right because uh -huh. you're so used to having at least a little natural reverb. Where it starts getting into like tuned rooms would be like what we would call like classical musical periods right now. You have big churches that are constructed with these huge vaulted um, ceilings. You have concert halls, orchestra halls. Keeping in mind that they're using reverb to amplify sound. There's no like, you know, you don't have a Kemper going into a PA in the uh, 1600s. I didn't think about that at all. Cause like I've been on the, the wavelength where reverb machines just meant like some type of electronic machine, but of course not. Venues, an opera house is kind of a big reverb machine. It's made with reverb in mind. Exactly. But what ends up happening where we're going to start talking about machines happens at the birth of recorded music. Yeah. Even the most primitive recordings, like folkways or the early blues recordings, things like that, it's capturing a performance of a person or people, but it's also capturing the space now. So you hear the room as much as you hear the performance, and it's just as much an integral part of, of that recording. So as rooms get bigger, recording technology gets better, um, studios come, right? And you have capital studios and these huge rooms with these huge ensembles. Where it gets really interesting is when Bill Putnam builds a studio in Chicago, downtown, called Universal Studios, and he builds a specific room that is the first echo chamber. I think it was a bathroom, right? <laughs> a room that has a speaker that they're pumping audio into and then a microphone. So they're able to take a, a sound that has no reverb and then artificially create that reverb in that space. That was like, that starts everything. Yeah, <laughs> that just reminds me of that joke from Parks and Rec where Andy goes into his apartment and is like, this bathroom has incredible reverb. Yeah. That was actually the first totally. echo chamber, like reverb machine, <laughs> exactly. was literally a bathroom. That's exactly right. I believe that that space has been torn down and it's now an all Saints. Oh, that's too bad. <laughs> Yeah. Would love to use the bathroom there. <laughs> <laughs> totally. But, okay, so Bill, yeah, Putnam, okay. Bill Putnam goes on, you know, he has a Universal Studio in Chicago. He mo moves to Los Angeles. He builds another studio, builds a bigger echo chamber. The echo chamber is something that you then see hap cropping up at all these other studios. It's the sound of a lot of hit records that Bill was making, and so people want that sound. It's also much more economical to have a room for it than trying to figure out how to get the big room always in use, you know, whatever. So echo chambers at Capitol. That was like Sinatra, the Beach Boys, an echo chamber that was built on the rooftop of Abbey Road in London, the attic echo chamber that was built in Motown. Those are all the sound of that record. Well, maybe not the sound. The space. It's, it's the recordings. ambience or the context in which those sounds are being heard. And even to today, like people still use echo chambers. I've recorded with my guitar in my bathroom. It sounds awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, 1957, German company, EMT 140. This is the first plate reverb. And this yeah. is shrinking down the idea of a room into what is a huge box still, but it's smaller than a room. And that is like kind of the first 
true analog reverb machine. It's a plate reverb. When you say plate, just a big metal plate. It's not a term for something. It's a big metal plate. It's just a big yeah, metal plate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's all it is. It's just a yeah. huge plate, but it's very thin, and it vibrates really well. So honestly, I'd love to just like show you the plate that I want to show you, which is over at Electrical Audio. Should we go on a field trip? <laughs> yes, let's go. Oh. <laughs> We're at Electrical Audio. Yeah. One of the greatest studios in the world. One of my favorite studios in the world. This is my friend Greg. Greg runs the show over here. Come down to the dungeon and watch your head. This will give you a new eyebrow, so yeah. be careful. And it's gotta be tucked away in the basement so that it doesn't pick up any sounds. Yeah, so every studio has just garbage in their basement, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. I'm just hoping. Is there a tape storage room? Which is just archival tape from different people over the years. Now we're underneath Studio A's control room. And here's the plate with this side. Boom. I managed to take the plate side off and now I can see wow. it in its glory. There's a stainless steel plate suspended by these clips on the edges. There are two PZO contact pickups on either end of the plate. Those are kind of the microphones that pick up the vibrations. Put the signal through here. This is a magnet and there's a coil that it fits in just like in a speaker. And the coil is attached to the plate. And so it shakes the plate with audio. And then the pickups pick up that audio in two different spots on the plate. A sound originates here, it goes out and bounces on all these edges as if it's a two dimensional rectangular room. Just bounces on every corner, bounces all around. As reflections keep going, the high frequencies roll off just by the physics of the metal and the reflections. So you have this initial bright and it just gets darker. Watch me break the plate. <laughs> <laughs> At its max, this would have like four seconds reverb time, four or five seconds reverb time. But you can make that 10 seconds by recording it at twice the speed. You can make a real cavernous, like, just And then we've done it, you know, everybody kind of does those sort of experiments as soon as they get a thing like this. They're just like, all right, what else can I do? <laughs> <laughs> and the reverse reverb, all that sort of stuff. For movies and for audio production, just making like reverb for whatever your need is. <laughs> yeah, I didn't think about its application for movies. Yeah, a lot of like what uh, drove like innovation in audio is like straight from the movies. When did these machines first start becoming available? They had to have started messing with this stuff in the 40s or 50s, maybe even earlier. I mean, the first person who picked up a piece of sheet metal would have realized that you, you know, as well as thunder, you can make it, <laughs> it'll like, <laughs> yeah. my voice sounds like it goes forever. The well, MT-140 is the first time that it was like Productized Mark, yes. and marketed for sure. All of these things came about as we started recording music more mm -hmm. properly mm -hmm. and not just the earliest, earliest recordings that are very, very crude. So, how prevalent were these big plates and how many popular songs does a plate like this appear on? Almost every song that has reverb in the 60s, a large portion of them have to be that. And that's continued up until like how long have these been used and they're still but they're still being used yeah a lot of people still every every nice studio probably has one even some crappy studios <laughs> pretty much if you've been listening to music at all in the last like 50 years you've heard a lot of big metal plates oh yeah probably most of your favorite records that existed before 1980 people are definitely still using it i'm sure it's just like in the mix with all the other board gear out there they exist and they're being used all the time and i'm sure there's like a million records being made now that have it how often do you use it here it probably gets used a quarter of the time oh is that dampener yeah so this we built a rod that goes I... up to a handle in the control room here it is here's the echo plate just so no one has to run up and down the stairs. We just put this little thing in here. Super cool. So we have like a remote control in a way. I love how you're just upstairs and there's all this mechanical movement going on underneath you. Can we plug something in today and hear it? Ooh. That's the plate. Man. That's the plate. Can we, get a, can we get a session running so we can get the straight audio? Uh, sure. Sounds this beautiful. Sounds beautiful. <laughs> Ooh. That was on me. Dude, I mean, that's part of like, you're exciting that yeah. play, you know? Play different, right? Yeah, I, I, well, I came in here like, I'm gonna play this song, this song, and this song, and now once I hear the play, it's like, no, I don't wanna play any of those. Yeah. I just wanna strum chords. I guess maybe I should wait until we have the raw audio from the thing. Or nah. Yeah, I mean, 
once you're running through the plate, you got uh -huh. <laughs> And I have a greater appreciation for it too, knowing that it's a big metal plate right beneath us that's getting this. I'll start recording. Okay. So this is the uh, yeah. plate, plate reverb. So right now, are we hearing just the plate reverb or are we hearing some of the guitars? Some of the guitars. I'll turn off that. So here's just the plate. Pretty bright and pretty short. There's mm -hmm. a clanging against the frame. <laughs> wow. You want to it hear sounds the beautiful. I know. <laughs> it really does. And it sounds familiar. It sounds very familiar. You can see why people sort of just like, oh yeah, we're going to use that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> have that fluttery effect mm -hmm. that a lot of digital reverbs have, like mm -hmm. where it's kind of, you hear that tail and it's like mm -hmm. I mean, you'd spend a lot of money on a outboard box or a plug-in for that, I feel like. You'd labor over it for hours to get something close to that. And there's also something to the psychology of just plugging it in, turning a knob until you like it and leaving it there and mm -hmm. happy with the, whatever results come. So. It's so simple, you know, it's yeah. just a stupid piece of metal, two $5 pickups, and a broken speaker. <laughs> <laughs> That's the plate. Mm -hmm. Now, as guitar players, we've been hearing the other main type of reverb machine. And there are so many more permutations of this type of reverb, and that is the spring reverb. Yeah, this one I am familiar with, because mm -hmm. the first amp I ever used had a spring reverb in it. And when you would move the amp, you would hear the spring, and I thought it was just broken. <laughs> yep, that is exactly the sound. That's it. And I, th and I thought for sure that my amp was broken. Mm -hmm. I had no idea that there is a physical spring that was in my amp that is reverberating, giving you the reverb. Yeah. Totally. And it's basically the same concept as the plate, right? And it actually predates the plate. So really? I'm not in a timeline anymore. I'm going to go really? back. So. Hammond. But did they use that in a studio? Did they use spring reverbs like for big studios or just plates? Because spring reverb is like a very particular sound. Yes, it is. But I, I'm gonna let you. I'm gonna <laughs> let you do it. There we go. Kind of sounds like that. Yeah, it sounds like a spring <laughs> in a box. Totally, but like the answer is yes and no. Different application, I would say, mm -hmm. and there are different types of spring reverb machines. But if we think about where it came from, yeah. It was like around the 30s, Hammond organs. It was like the thing. And they started putting little spring reverbs into the organ. Mm -hmm. So now at home, you have an organ, you can just flip on the reverb and it sounds like you're in a, a church. It becomes so wildly popular that Hammond breaks off a new company, Acusonics, and they manufacture the first standalone spring reverb tank called the Type 4 mm -hmm. Spring Reverb. And that's Which, probably what made it into the studio is the standalone. It's what made it into every amp. So like yeah. that was like around the same time as the EMT. So that would have been late 50s. So the reverb machines, that one, other than after the echo chamber, we're actually using a room. It was first for consumer products before. I did not know that. I would have assumed first the studios would get it without a shadow of a doubt. The biggest piece and how it ends up being so ubiquitous for us is that Fender grabs it. And they put the Type 4 into a reverb unit. That was li literally the amp that I was talking about was a Fender mm -hmm. reverb. Totally. When we're talking about the spring reverb, it works just like a plate reverb, except it's a spring in a little metal box. Yeah, it's and the you... same concept. Yeah, you're giving the spring a signal, and then at the other point, it's receiving it after it's reverberated through the spring. Exactly, and that's uh -huh. like, when we're talking about analog reverb machines, it's all about exciting something with an electrical signal, and then taking that signal and producing an electrical signal again and bringing it out, now you have audio. 
yeah. right? That is a true analog reverb machine. Mm -hmm. Fender starts using the Type 4 in the standalone Fender reverb unit. Yeah. It kind of looks like this. It's a little bit bigger. This is my friend Chris Benson, who builds these in Portland. Chris is a, a, a genius and a craftsman, and this is a fantastic and it's beautiful. Unit. Absolutely, it's and it sounds right. great. Uh, and, and we can run some signal into this yeah. so you can kind of hear what it sounds like. But this is a tube version of it, so it's like the old, old, old ones. How big is the actual spring that's in like a machine like this? Or in like so, the Fender Reverbs, how big is the spring? We can just actually see almost exactly what Oh, okay, doing. we actually have, whoa! Okay, so there is... It's already reverberating a lot. Analog Outfitters made these uh, for a while. It's an effects unit, but they have this spring in it. And this is an Accusonics, basically what is a Type 4, but a more modern production unit. But you see the springs in there, right? So that's the Type 4. So this was in the back of the amp and why I thought it was broken whenever I moved it around when it was on. Exactly. I mean, it's in literally like every amp that has reverb, the, If as long as it's not a DSP, yeah. like powered amp, it will have a spring. Because it, it, it does seem like a pretty cheap... I mean, yeah, I mean, it's basically like a bunch of bed springs. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Strung out with a little pickup system. And, and with this, like, I'm so familiar with spring reverb because since it was in all these machines for so long, particularly as a guitar player, it's a very guitar-y sound. It's a very guitar-y reverb. In any, you know, even digital reverb machine, it has a spring option because it has a very particular sound. So it first started as, like, the sound of surf. You know, surf music, you know, is that reverb unit. And because that was so wildly popular, you see tons of other spring reverb tanks coming out. And I don't have a lot of them here, but there are a lot. Should we plug in and yeah. hear spring reverb? Yeah. We're going to start with the Benson. You can already. Exactly. On the Benson, what we have is we have dry signal. So if we turn off the reverb entirely, right, there's your dry yeah, signal. Yeah, and this is something where, like, and a guitar without any reverb on it at all is a little... Odd. Yeah. We have the dry signal. If we bring in the wet sound, we bring it up further. So, so what I'm doing there <laughs> is I have, it's actually a pretty short reverb. Mm -hmm. I'm jacking up the volume of the reverb, but the dwell knob is actually keeping it pretty close. If I were to So this is this how long the reverb goes for. And it has that spring reverb sound I'm so used to. Yeah. I also love how all the reverb machines, you have the dry and wet signal. Mm -hmm. I just like that it sounds like my guitar is getting more and more it's into the ocean or something. Absolutely. <laughs> but I do think that, you know, when we were talking about the plate and how the plate sounds, the plate is bright up front and then dulls out as it goes on. With a spring, to me, it just always sounds bright. Yeah. Even as it's trailing, I'm getting a lot of high end. Now there are some machines like this one where we can actually tune that and actually EQ. So we could do a high pass, we could do a low pass, we can make it really dark or whatever. And this has a bunch of springs in it too. You just can't sing them. But this is like late 70s-ish. This would be more of a studio tool. Yeah, I can see whenever it has these things. They yeah, wanna... totally. And it's, this one has a lot of rack rash on it for yeah, sure. Yeah, this has been through a lot. And absolutely, and you put a VU on anything, and it's like, it's a piece of pro audio now, you know? <laughs> uh, but, yeah, you get that needle moving. It's... But I think that the larger point here is like, this would be paired with a guitar amplifier. This is more of a piece of outboard gear. Well, what exactly does outboard to... mean? Yeah, outboard. so like at a studio, you have a console, right? That's the, the board or whatever. Outboard would be the things that you could run the signal out of the board and into those effects and bring it back uh -huh. into the box. Let's get a little bit of a surf rock sound. Just... Yeah, yeah. Get it's copyright. just that. Yeah, it's just that. <laughs> you, you get, because if I start going, wow, then, then YouTube's going to start coming after us. Yeah. But, we, but we get the idea. Do that yeah. same high riff without reverb. <laughs> yeah, ooh, and when it stops all abruptly, it's a little odd. <laughs> it's kind of uncomfortable. To me, it kind of sounds like it's like metal. Yeah, well, we gotta distort <laughs> you know it. I mean? You gotta crank this to like, you know, well, totally. 348. But I, again, it's all oh, yeah. that application. Like, yeah, you play yeah. the same riff, it's gonna sound like Ride the Lightning. And then on the other side, it's going to sound like Dick Dale. Uh -huh. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? It's like, it's really, reverb is the ultimate shaper of vibe. 
it uh -huh. is the vibe of, of what you're listening to. Let's plug into this one. Okay. okay. So this is Analog Outfitters. We already talked about the spring. Mm -hmm. What you're seeing here is a rotating mechanism. It creates a, a vibrato. So oh. if, if we turn off the reverb and we do... So if I, if I can increase the speed. It's really cool that you can see it too. So is that, cause I've seen people getting vibrato by just getting a speaker that spins around really quickly. Same concept. When we start talking about echo versus reverb, early echo units used a rotating oil can in order to get the repeats that we're talking about. I'm gonna keep the speed really low and I'm just gonna bring up that spring reverb now. Actually. That's why I don't yeah. want to play. You, you, oh, yeah. do, you do that. <laughs> <laughs> the reason why I wanted to bring this one in, pairing reverb with other effects, mm -hmm. that's where I think that reverb can often like really shine. Now with this one, what we're doing is we're pairing it with this vibrato, which gives an already shimmery reverb mm -hmm. effect, even a little bit more depth because of the movement, Yeah. right? And it just has that in there. Especially when you consider, this is a whole other tangent, but guitars are just kind of out of tune mm -hmm. all the time. And so having a little bit of movement in the notes, maybe, well, that's a lot, yeah. is, is just very, just even just a little bit subtle adds a whole lot. It's mm -hmm. almost like, I, you know, I've worked on my vibrato, my left hand vibrato yeah. so much. This you can just... Yeah, you don't need to do it at all. <laughs> What's this garbage? It's yeah. just way, this is wasted energy. Totally. <laughs> or maybe this, this makes it way more efficient. It's a little bit more expensive. Yeah, but yeah. It makes it more efficient. But then you don't need to worry about, you know, doing this garbage. Especially with this. Ooh. <laughs> We're talking about how awesome it is to be in the studio shooting with people. That's the first live concert I've seen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just sitting here like, wow. You know? Once I start playing guitar, I could be here for 28 hours. Uh, well, so. totally. 61, 62, Fender brings mm -hmm. in the reverb tank into those. Now everybody can buy the Type 4. So now you have a Supro brand. Basically every amplifier brand has Puts a spring reverb. in it, yep. Do they use digital reverb? Is that a thing for modern amps? That yeah. just started becoming a thing right when I started becoming a guitar player. Basically 1975, mm -hmm. everything goes digital. And there's like- That early? It's really early. Late 60s, maybe early 70s, they put out the EMT 250, which is basically looks like R2D2. Uh, and it's got some yeah. like faders on it or whatever. And it's a digital version of so that. So digital, plate. that was used in studios? Mm -hmm. Since 1975? Really? Yeah. And, and every pedal, yeah. every pedal that you have uh -huh. that says reverb on it, even if it says analog, they're lying. It's not analog. It might be an analog circuit, like they're using analog components. It's, it's all made to emulate mm -hmm. these things. It started with these analog machines with real springs, real rooms, and then we got to digital machines. But since so much music was made and so much of the guitar sound came from these analog machines, these machines still are emulating them mm -hmm. a lot. And the machines too are, again, it's not ancient history. These are still being used. I think that's really cool that there was this physical thing that was a solution to a problem. And that particular characteristic of it, people really liked. So mm -hmm. we continue to do it even when it's not the most efficient solution to that problem anymore. And I think that's really cool. Absolutely. The most famous and probably ubiquitous studio spring reverb is the AKG BX20. It's a big box, it's got springs in it. Again, same transducer sort of a thing. You can tune it, you can move the contact mics around, I believe. Greg will be able to talk to us a little bit about that. So this is the AKG BX20 spring reverb. This is probably as big as spring reverbs get. 
It's the biggest one I've seen. This is what powers Studio A. <laughs> <laughs> I like how it's moving too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Inside this tube, there is two sets of springs that go down all the way down and back up again. There's two channels. And it's like, you know, the spring reverb that you see in a guitar amp, you know, which are really small, but this is stretched out. The springs are different sizes and lengths to create sort of a less boingy sort of sound, a little more even diffused sound. But yeah, it's massively overbuilt and really impossible to service. <laughs> <laughs> it just goes to show like how desperate they were to make reverb from nothing, you know? Like, it's like, we need reverb. <laughs> and, and yeah. When would you use this exact reverb? The quality is very smooth and, and dark. Like uh, it doesn't have as much shimmery high gloss as the plate reverb. It's a little bit more spooky. In your mind, when you think of like a, a spring reverb, it's just like boing, 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 and Dick Dale and all that sort of stuff. And mm -hmm. but this is like a real reverb sound, you know, high quality studio reverb sound. And just because it's much bigger, it's just designed better and made, you know, stabilized and tuned just right. Some people have it in the studio on the countertop of the rack, which you know probably causes problems because. Yeah. Even though it's suspended as well, you know, like people like to slam their fist on the counter saying, like, I want to play this song now! <laughs> <laughs> Basically suspended tank, and inside the tank is a metal framework. It does look like a flux capacitor. It's a crazy network of springs going up and down with suspension with little nodes in the middle to keep it there. Relative to a plate, is it... Is it pretty close or does no, it? No, it's, it's, it's much darker. And, and it does, if you overload it, you'll get that boinginess and because it'll, it'll like bottom out or, you know, I don't know exactly mechanically what's happening, but it's, you'll get that, that whiplash kind of sound effect. And I don't, we don't like doing that because I would risk breaking a spring and then I'll have to go in here and swear all week and, <laughs> and then we'll throw it in the river because yeah. we're mad and get like a, a microverb and yeah. hide it down here. <laughs> This would em emulate like a room reverb. It, it won't sound like a real room. It'll be like a more, you know, like big hall, big auditorium maybe, or or just like a cave. It's it's more of a special effect kind of thing as opposed to a realistic replacement of a room. I do think an interesting point, these machines were built maybe to try and get that room sound, but where it fell short, you know, it is kind of what makes it special. Yeah. And then after these machines are all on these all of these different recordings, now the reverb that people are chasing is the artificial reverb. Yeah, because at some point this was just your best option. Yeah, and and this ended up being these the plates and, and the springs, like everything was pressed onto all the records that you were fanatical about. And so those have sort of brainwashed you into thinking this is like how a good thing should sound. Just like with an old tube amplifier, like you can make a perfect amplifier now that's like perfectly efficient, no distortion and everything like that, but no one wants to play that amplifier. I'm, I so appreciate you saying that. People swear by their tube amps and analog gear, but we've grown to like, it's like an acquired case that we now want. That's our fancy new water heater. What I type of reverb does this make? <laughs> Off. It's really dead, like yeah. high frequency rolls off immediately. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and then here's just the amp. And that's the spring. This is the spring. And you can kind of hear the, the different notes sort of excite the spring differently. So like one, it's two different springs, the left and right are two different, totally isolated springs. And you can kind of hear them react differently to different notes in a cool way. And we have the remote for that up here too. Reverb time again. You can kind of hear the yeah. noise. And that noise is doing what to the springs? It's an amplifier that inverses the sound coming back off the springs and adds it to the sound. So it sort of cancels out the reverb a little bit. It's an electronic sort of dampening. It's not really an, a mechanical okay. acoustic thing. They reuse feedback that's out of phase with the signal to sort of cut down in the length mm -hmm. of the reverb. There's a lot more bass to this one. Yeah, it's a lot more uh, low frequency. What you would end up doing, unless you were recording just your guitar and that was the recording or whatever, but when you start putting this in context of other things, you're probably gonna roll off a lot of that low end mm -hmm. and, and, and try and tune it in with EQ outboard or either on the board or otherwise. It is definitely for like a more warm reverb and the plate would be the more shimmery bright reverb. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like here's just for comparison. Like I can make it longer yeah. if you want. That sounds 
It they're both like lovely. Candle, it, right? Yeah, it really does. Like, the, I definitely prefer the plate, but I mean, they're, they both sound great. But. And if you do strike it, you do hear that boy, 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 yeah, a, yeah. a little bit. But it, for a singer or something, it's a little more of a fluid, kind of warm thing. Mm -hmm. If you have a really sibilant singer, you know, that'll cut down some of that. Whereas the plate, you'll hear the shh kind of noise of the S's. Yeah, I noticed that too on really high notes. But yeah, this is a lot better with the high notes. Like the, well, I mean, not better or worse, it's but different. like the plate really, like, it really shimmers on the high notes. And this one has some odd low end to right. it, which I'm sure, as you were saying, you would just roll off. So that's just adding a high pass filter, rolling off the lowest of the lows. And it's not that. Okay, so here's, we're back on to spring. And now can we hear it in plate? Mm -hmm. This is the uh, plate. plate. Way different. <laughs> Yeah, that's for like really big, big room. You probably are using the plate as like, you know, 80% the microphone, 20% yeah. the plate. So if you want to hear it kind of like how he would. Yeah. If you wanted to play, I can sort of like hear. Yeah. That sounds beautiful. the plate yeah it's nice i love it can we turn the plate and the spring on at the same time and turn them all the way up and turn the amp down <laughs> sure <laughs> see what that's like <laughs> It's totally a wash. <laughs> Just have to have a person <laughs> and a big mixing board. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, could we hear if you put a little bit of the amp in the signal and then do that? <laughs> Analog vibrato. <laughs> Love it. this is maybe the most expensive way that you could do this. <laughs> they have two, I have two very different characteristics. I'm trying to keep them like kind of in the middle. Yeah, they're accentuating different parts of the sound. Making my way back to Reverb. Jim tells me he has some really crazy modern and experimental analog reverb machines to check out. And uh, I'm 
might have got a little lost. But while I have you here, at the beginning of this year, I came out with a guitar course called Guitar Quest for beginners, even if you've never held a guitar before. And it's super fun. I stand by it. It was my main project throughout the last year. And if you've made it a half hour into this video, it looks like you're into music. And I highly suggest you pick up a guitar, whether you do it with my course or not. But if you want to do it with me, guitar course, guitar course, guitar quest is linked at the top of the description. And it's super, super fun. And you'll learn guitar way quicker than you thought you were going to. Okay. I think I'm on the right trail. They sound awesome. They look really, really great um, as well. And as everybody who owns a studio knows, if you have good looking gear, you can charge more money. <laughs> so, it does sound amazing. And if I had one reverb that I would like to own that I don't, that I would have forever, and I could replace all my other reverbs, it would probably be a BX20. Yeah. Why don't we get you playing the baritone? Okay. So. Ooh, sounds good. start playing with reverb, I play differently than with I'm yeah. like super dry. You can hide behind the reverb a little bit. I've been doing that my whole yeah. life. <laughs> I mean, that sounds rad to me. Yeah, it, does. It, it It sounds rad mostly because I, I don't play baritones all that often. <laughs> it sounds, it just feels cool. Something that I really like about really washy reverb is that it's kind of a sustain. Mm -hmm. Like all the notes that you play, everything that you play kind of sticks around for a little while. Absolutely. And depending on the, what music you're playing, you know, that could be really, really good most of the time. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> all right. Audio out. Pedals. Virtually every pedal that says reverb on it is a digital reverb. Mm -hmm. There are some exceptions. One of my favorite ones is this. This is the Dan Electro Spring King. This is a totally new modern. I think the first ones came out in the 90s. So I'm getting the idea that these reverb machines didn't really change very much from like 1970 to- The spring digital. didn't change. Yeah. It was that the spring got put into different things. And in this case, this is a very, a, definitely a more modern piece. Mm. But like the idea of the spring is old. It was replaced by digital reverb because it's easier. Like uh -huh. the size of this pedal is massive relative to, you know, an earthquake or avalanche run. The cool thing about these is that like it's an actual spring. It. it actually has a kick pad oh. that you're supposed <laughs> to do that. Like that's why they put it right here. <laughs> <laughs> it's satisfying. <laughs> well, it's the, that exact sound that I remember as a kid where I thought something was horribly wrong. And here, this is like made to just do that. That's just really funny. I didn't horribly know Horribly right. Yeah. Horribly right. Ooh, bring the, bring the reverb down maybe to half. That's a metal tune of mine, but it just sounds like it's just surf rock mm -hmm. with just a bunch of reverb yep. on it, a bunch of spring reverb. Yeah, that's just surf rock. <laughs> this is a very new pedal. It came out early part of last year. Okay. So that's why I wanted to bring this one in. This is an optical spring. I don't think that's a guitar. I think that's a spring. Yeah, I'm not doing that. So there's a basically a, a feedback setting oh, okay. that feeds back on itself. I can hear it. <laughs> what? <laughs> This is going through this. So, what I'm doing right now is okay, let's take the reverb like all the way yeah. back. Okay. There's your dry sound. I'm gonna bring in the spring. I'm using it. And now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take. 
take out your dry signal yeah. entirely. Oh, so now we're just hearing what's on the other end of it. That's all coming from the spring itself? So I'm, yeah, so, ooh. So there's an optical sensor in here. Optical meaning there's like a little photo sensor yeah. that as it, it sees the light, it will open up more. If it's not seeing the light, it will close. I'm hopefully not bastardizing yeah. this pedal description. Uh -huh. It sounds really cool, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. especially the harmonic. Can we go back to harmonic for yeah, a second? Yeah, let me just give it one note. That's just the spring. Yeah, here, let me turn off dry real quick and let me just bring up a little bit more. Just give me one yeah. note. Oh, you're like giving it different harmonics, so it's like making different chords. Changing notes, everybody. basically feeding back on itself to to a certain extent and then there's this control knob which is what to me sounds like is is altering uh, some sort of pitch set relative to what you're playing so when we hear those overtones now we're kind of tuning those overtones that are now relative to what you're playing anyway that's a, that's a long-winded way of saying this sounds badass yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, so. it has like, like a really like a distorted beauty to it mm -hmm. again though inherently it's just a spring it's just a little spring and this company has taken that technology and made something really creative with it so yeah all right do we even need my guitar for this one no that's why i brought the synth throw this um, thing out i have the moog here the moog uh is it's just moog? here because it is moog I it is. Uh, a lot of people do because it's two O's, but it's pronounced Moog. This is one of their newer semi-modular rigs called the Sound Studio, but I'm mainly just this. using it for the subharmonicon because I love this instrument so much. Yeah, it, now we're in full Andrew Huang, you know. I was going to say, we need him here to do like yeah. a... I don't have the sound effect. <laughs> oh, I'll do it for you. Hey, I'm Jim! Yeah, there we go. All right. What's the first thing that you notice about this unit? Is that the springs are on the outside. Which means and... that you can play the springs as much as you want or as little as you want uh, so <laughs> yeah you can just not play it at all that's also an option you can scratch oh. it you can then tune it you can increase the, or decrease the length of time itself ooh We're in like the weirdest <laughs> Les Claypool band. Wow, okay, I I, that's already a lot more musical than I was expecting to get out of this. Ooh! Hold on, hold on, I gotta get over here. So, Ooh, 
I wish we had a drum set set up. I didn't think that we'd be doing anything like this. This is the Ektal Moisturizer. That's what this unit okay. is called. All right. It is a standalone instrument that you can play. What we had um, initially was just, just the reverb. Okay, yeah. that's the, that's the, it's just the sound of a reverb. But it has filters, it has a LFO on it, which if we turn up the filter now, we can change it to a square wave. We can change the resonance of it. Change the speed of it. <laughs> and change the filter mode. Yeah, that's, that's a moisturizer. Okay, so that's really cool in and of itself. I got a lovely little card for you here, oh yeah. Mm. <laughs> Ooh, if I can get like two notes here. Whoa, hey! <laughs> Whoa! I see why you like this. I see why you like this. <laughs> so cool. Oh. He's the only he's the only person in the world that's ever tried to make a tunnel. <laughs> <laughs> this guy. <laughs> Hold on, wait, I think I can get a usable pitch out of this. Just one second. It's actually, you totally can. Yeah, you totally can if you're really good. Yeah. As if it couldn't get any cooler, is if we start running signal into it. So right now, what I have here is you can have an audio in, and you can take audio outs of all of these different things. So right now, we're just taking a full... We, we're getting everything out into the amp. But if I just like, I, if we, I don't know what the sequence is here, but like. Oh. This is just, I got two oscillators. Here's my first oscillator. I can bring in the second one. I'm running two sequences. I can create a polyrhythm if I wanted to. Let's go to something really simple so that we can hear that. Whatever, yeah, like we, yeah. can, we can make it even like. Okay, so you're getting some of that high end still. Mm -hmm. Now, I, this is just straight in. I'm, I'm not really doing anything. Reverb's all the way down. Stop exciting us for a second. And we'll bring in the reverb on it. Oh, and now we're going to space. Out of that initial attack by kind of like smearing those attacks more. I can obviously bring it up in the mix. Let's bring it back down so it's just kind of a subtle, it's just there. We'll bring in that filter section now. This sounds like a video game that I would really like. So let's take, let's just listen to the reverb now. It gets all nice and washy. I can even make it more washy by just like... Bit. 
It's like palm muting it almost. Mm -hmm. And if you just do, if you just mute one of the one of the springs now. But what if you get the exact harmonics on the springs, like you get right exactly in the middle? That's kind of hard to do. Well, we can just, let's just listen to just the reverb. Yeah. Oh, you get kind of distorted. What if I just... Oh, because it's got to go through my fingers. Oh. It's like just now that I'm now I'm getting just the filter in. This is how synth music is made. Yeah. <laughs> and this I, is all analog too. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I mean, again, if we think about that type four over there, about this mm -hmm. big, right? Now we have it shrunk down into a smaller. We have it shrunk down to a smaller. We have it shrunk down to a smaller. And and then you have something like if we're talking about modular. You know, IntelliGel makes this one, which is called and a spring And there's the springs in there, little box. Springs in here. So now you hook this into your into your modular rig, right? Your Euro rack rig, mm -hmm. and maybe this mounts in the back. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe you keep it outward so you can like hit it around and jiggle mm -hmm. it around or whatever, and do the spring thing. That's kind of the through line of this. Yeah. Is that you have a plate that's made in 1957 and it becomes the studio tool. I don't believe anybody has ever brought that plate idea into this, right? Uh -huh. Whereas the spring, it's cheap, and yeah. it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. And it's in every amp, it's in every piece of outboard gear. Anything that says reverb on it is generally going to have a spring on it or a digital emulation of a spring. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the story of analog. <laughs> yeah. I think that this is the first time that we've ever done a video on screen I think so, together yeah. properly. Yeah. And it's been a great. darn pleasure. Rob. Yeah, it has been. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming in. Thank and, you for coming and, in. Yeah, I guess I guess that's just not mine. I'm not here. I'm just so used to filming at home. Wow. Okay. A shout out to Reverb. If you're looking for rare gear or just music gear in general, Reverb.com. Be careful with the app, though. What I found. <laughs> I walked in here to this building like, oh, here's where a lot of my money went. Yeah. <laughs> Everything here was sourced through Reverb and Jim. So if you have anything to plug. I would say one, you should download the app. Uh, it's at your own peril. At your own peril, for sure. Um, but it's a great discovery tool. You'll find stuff that you've never seen anywhere else and you'll find it every day. So that's plug number one. Plug number two is we've talked a lot about the history of Reverb pedals. We have a feature length film coming out called The Pedal Movie. Uh, it's actually already out um, and you should check it out. We do uh, as much of a deep dive into reverb as we do with every other effect. So you should definitely check it out and download it wherever you want. Awesome. <laughs> well, thanks so much. And if you would like to subscribe to my channel too, we're going to be on a bunch more musical adventures if you would like to tag along. So Hell yeah. yeah, maybe consider subscribing and we'll see you sometime soon. Cheers. Yeah, thanks, Jim. This is like the 12th end screen. <laughs> <laughs> so if we're not great actors, there is you go. Is that all right, Mike? Yeah.